welcome. Happy Friday. Today is July 5th, and this is Frequently Asked Questions for Beginning Beekeepers, episode 24. It's 89 degrees outside in the shade. So it is hot and sweaty. So the sequences that you're watching today up on the sides here were shot this morning out in the heat, and I was all sweaty and everything else just for you. So thank you again. This is episode 24. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description and light item by light item. I'll write down what we're discussing today. And we really need to get back outside and start taking care of those bees because storms are coming. And uh, this is a great chance I'm putting on honey supers right now. So lots going on out there. We're going to put on those flow supers. If you're interested in a flow hive and you're shopping around for their stuff, there's a discount coupon in the video description and at the end of this video there's a giveaway by the Blythewood Bee Company so watch until the very end and uh, I'll explain that and I'll give you a link in the video description so that you can enter that contest it's uh, an item that's going to be worth quite a bit for most of you all right so we'll get right into it uh, Thomas Komet can adult bees consume protein not from plants and uh, not from plants, so animal protein. Well, we know that honeybees get their nourishment from plants. But there are instances where people are concerned that bees are actually eating other bees. More specifically, they're eating other bees before they're hatched. They want to know if the nurse bees inside the colony are removing and relocating or even ingesting the bees laid by the, or the eggs laid by the queen. So can that happen? Are bees designed to eat things beyond plant proteins? Most bees don't eat solids. They're not designed for it. They're designed to ingest liquids or something very close to a liquid. We do know that they get some of the pollens into their stomach because uh, they store fats, especially the nurse bees. As we go into winter, they have the ability to store large resources of fat in their abdomens. And that's actually what the Varroa destructor mite goes after. That's why the mites attach themselves to the abdomens of the worker bees and the drones in some cases, and uh, they're actually feeding upon those stored fats. So they can eat semi-solids. Now, one of the questions, this led me on a, you know, a search for information. Uh, I was concerned that, uh, are they actually eating extra eggs from the queen, or are they just chewing them up and getting rid of them? Some people say that they're reabsorbing them, some people say that they're just removing the eggs and discarding them. You'll see them carrying them like ants. And if you didn't already know, ants are a social insect and honeybees are actually in the ant family. It's true. So do they eat proteins other than plant proteins? 99.9% .9 of the time, all they're eating are resources that they can get from plants. And uh, right now, for example, there are milkweeds everywhere. They're all over the milkweed. They're all over the privets. I have several varieties of milkweeds that I'm planting just for the bees. But uh, we'll talk about that later. The question remains unanswered, whether or not bees eat animal proteins. Honey bees don't really have that ability. So what they do is they're gathering nectar. In the process of gathering nectar, they're also getting solids in the form of bee pollen. So that's the protein. And the protein, as we know, is used for baby bee and larvae development. So how do they get the uh, bee bread, which is fermented processed pollen by the bees? How do they recycle that and turn it into a suitable resource that the developing larvae will consume? Well, they have to ingest solids to do that, but they're plant solids. They're not uh, insect solids or other animals. So I'm going to have to say they consume proteins not from plants. As a rule, no, based on the fundamental design of the bee, they don't have chewing mouth parts that, that start pre-digestion the way animals like humans do and uh, other animals that are designed to eat animal protein. They can't uh, process it. So they do ingest particulates, but they're from plants. The question remains whether or not they can even eat the eggs of the queen. And why would they do that anyway? Sometimes the queen gets ahead of herself and she starts laying eggs everywhere. And then overnight, you'll notice that those eggs are gone. I witness this all the time. I watch bees all the time. Well, you know, within reason. 
I spend hours and hours observing honeybee behavior inside the hive. And I have seen it where the queen will lay several rows of eggs well beyond what the bees can take care of. Sometimes when they go into a summer dearth, and a dearth period is just when the environment is not providing the resources they need to continually raise healthy brood. So the workers will follow along behind the queen and they will remove the eggs. The problem is I can't see if they're eating the eggs, which some speculate that they do. I can't see if they're pulling them out and hustling them away because all the other bees get in the way. And when their head is down in the cell, I don't have a cutaway cell, so I can't see what they're doing to the eggs. Uh, so if they're eating them, I think that's a stretch. And nobody that I could find has witnessed the bees actually chewing and ingesting or reabsorbing, as some people say, the eggs. Even people that say they do it, when I ask, oh, did you see it? How did, how did you know? Did you find the contents of eggs in their digestive system? So how did that go? And there's always the, I'll get back to you, I'll look into it, and uh, I don't have solid answers. So what I found is some people are basically recycling information that somebody told them that bees eat the eggs, that they can ingest eggs. And, uh, but if you know a study, put it down in the comment section. I would love to read it. So if somebody's actually observed it, has video, has done some kind of, uh, you know, microanalysis of the bees' contents of their stomach and found out that they had animal protein in there, that would be very interesting and sounds like something that somebody in an entomology department would be doing uh, to find out what the diet of the bee is. But I think for now, we're solid that they get nectar from plants and that often that nectar gets mixed up with pollen and sometimes they ingest pollen and uh, they use that to build up their resources, particularly for winter. And we know the nurse bees are gonna recycle some of that pollen and they're gonna make bee bread in the pollen stores. And then they're gonna recycle that into components of royal jelly, which come from glands on the sides of those nurse bees. And then uh, it's also gonna be a component of rearing the larvae as they get older. So they start everything on royal jelly and then those mixes change as the larvae develop. So it's pretty interesting stuff, interesting area, well beyond, I think, beginner beekeeping. So we're trying to keep it simple and not uh, go overboard, but if you know somebody at some university that's doing that study, I would love to read it. So the next question, Glenn Copeland. Seasons in North America, what can we expect here? What should we be doing to help our colonies with health and pests, nutrition, feed, and harvesting? All right, well, if you don't already know, I'm in the northeastern United States, I'm in the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm along the Great Lakes region. So it's frequently referred to as a snow belt. We get really cold. And uh, what do we expect to do throughout the seasons? Well, let's start with what do we do to help the colonies? Well, what you're watching in the videos on the sides here is what I'm doing, which is planting a lot of flowering resources that provide nectar and pollen for the bees. The absolute best thing you can do for any bees, your own or others, and other pollinators, is to continually plant resources that sustain them through the growing year. Obviously, when it comes to winter time, all those plants die back, and now the bees are depending on the resources that they have. So this time of year, today specifically, July 5th, we're not feeding the bees because they're bringing in resources out the wazoo. There are pollen and nectar resources in, in every direction outside right now. I also live next to a very large creek watershed area that provides an abundant source of untouched plants. So agriculture is not involved in the French Creek watershed and uh, there are so many floral elements. And this year I'm planting, I have the seeds here in the back, I am planting swamp milkweed. And that's a milkweed that grows very well in the wetlands and we have some on my property that is definitely wetlands. And uh, one of the reasons I have the property that I do and portions of it are untouched is because there are protected plant species back there and they couldn't run a road through it. So I'm planting the resources that will continually bloom through the summer so I don't have a dearth, so my bees are going. Uh, here's the thing. I notice that we have white clover everywhere, and normally the bees will be all over the clover. They're not. They're on milkweed. They're on the privets. They're on other flowering plants that I can't even find right now. But I would say the number one plant for the bees right now is going to be the milkweed. And they're ignoring 
the uh, white clover, which makes fantastic honey, and I was really looking forward to that. But if they're ignoring it, that's actually a good thing because that tells me they're finding more in other places. So they have a lot coming in. All my hives are booming with uh, nectar coming in. They're all venting. Uh, so if you've got, let's talk about what to do this time of year, make sure that your hive vents are open. If you may notice also, if you see the video sequences that I'm showing today, I have my hive visors on and they're providing shade on the front of the hives and they are providing a rain shield for the landing boards so they stay dry. We've got storms coming in this afternoon. I want you to look at, when you see those video sequences, the front of those beehives and you'll see the clusters of bees outside and they've angled themselves across the face of the hive to stay in the shade that is transient, of course, as the sun moves, the shade is moving across the face. The clusters of the bees move with the shade from those hive visors. So those things I put on this year, designed them myself. I don't know if you can buy some anywhere, but they're very easy to make. And they are a huge bonus to my colonies that have them on. The other thing, let's revisit this lighted racks that we put on. They're supposed to help stop bearding. They provide more space inside. No, it doesn't work. So the slatted racks, although they provide space at the bottom of a deep brood box, they are not uh, causing the bees to stay inside and hang out and uh, have more space just to be idle. They still do that on the face on the outside of the hive. They still beard. And it was funny, while I was out videoing today, one of the beards hanging off the landing boards actually fell in a clump in the grass. And I tried to video it, but they, they collected themselves too soon. So uh, the critical thing that you want to make sure that your bees have is water, lots of fresh water. We have a pond, I showed that. We have, uh, we have uh, lots of water resources. I have very clear fresh water. The other thing we wanna make sure, and that's why I put these out here is to remind myself, these are Himalayan pink crystal salts. I mix these at one teaspoon per quart of fresh water and I put that out for the bees and the bees visit those uh, salt water drinkers equally as much as they do the fresh water drinkers. So this provides them with the mineral content that they need. As you all know, especially when you're sweating a lot, we need, bees don't perspire, so don't think I'm saying that, but uh, we need salts and minerals constantly replenished in our bodies so that we can function well. Bees are no different. So I highly suggest if you're looking for something to do for your bees, one teaspoon per quart, of sea salts of every choice. These are the Celtic sea salts. These are Himalayan sea salts. Uh, whatever you can find, they have it in the grocery store. Even Morton Salts has sea salt. So that's not a nutrition source. Those are minerals that help them process nutrition. So it's very interesting. Someone speculated a while ago that uh, by providing sea salts, we're also helping them cure their honey. So I recycled that question back to several experts and uh, nobody could give any evidence about that. So I don't know if it helps secure the honey. I know the bees go after it and the bees consume it. And if you're listening to the bees and paying attention to what they're showing us they want, you will put out mineral salts in liquid form. Now, yes, I did try other uh, salinity levels. I tried two teaspoons per quart and three teaspoons per quart and half a teaspoon per quart. And so in past testing, that's how I came up with a one teaspoon per quart. That's what the bees most frequently use. So you don't have to waste your time trying to figure out what the formula is. One teaspoon per quart, put it out there. And uh, pests, monitor for pests. You're, like right now, this afternoon, after I get done making this video, I'm putting my honey supers on. Even the Saskatrass bees are doing great. We might get honey off of those bees and they showed up as package bees. So they're booming. This is actually a good year. It looked terrible at the beginning. But anyway, so we put that on there. Uh, I do have a colony that is a swarm collection. So because I collected a swarm, put those in a box, I am not doing anything with them. I'm gonna hopefully just let them expand. And uh, we're gonna do some experimenting with them, but we're not taking honey off of them. So you can put feed on. If you've just collected a swarm or something, you can put sugar syrup on there because you're not drawing that off. So don't worry about that. The thing is they may ignore the sugar syrup. My observation hive has sugar syrup on it and they were consuming, oh, a pint every two or three days. Now they're consuming nothing. That means they're drawing all that they need from the environment and the feeder's on, it's in there and I refresh it. So they are consuming nothing. So for harvesting here in Pennsylvania, I don't get a harvest in the spring. I just let them use what they have. They're in 
an intense state of buildup. So I let them keep all of their resources. As you know, we had lots of rain, rain all over the country this year. So that's an issue. I won't be harvesting any honey until probably August and September. And I have one flow hive right now. It's a flow hive two that came through winter. Their flow frames are 70% full right now. So I know that colony is going to probably give me three harvests this year. And that's half a gallon of honey per frame. And that's a six frame flow hive. My other flow hives are all seven frame flow hives, half a gallon per frame. So that's going to put out a lot Their Their numbers are great. They did swarm earlier. Um, I marked queen flow away. So I have a new queen in there who's hybridized with this area and they are just doing great. So the other thing is, do you treat? What kind of treatments do you do? And that's the reason I bring up the fact that we're putting the flow supers and stuff on today. If you were going to treat your bees, you want to do those treatment cycles before you put your supers on. Or if your supers are going to be on, you have to insulate the supers from the bees while you treat the bees. And the only treatment that uh, I personally would use, and I'm going to have to do it with the swarm I have, some of the Saskatrass bees are going to require treatment. Apparently, they're not Varroa resistant enough. So you still have to provide some kind of leg up when they're dealing with Varroa, but we're going to do Varroa counts and see how that goes. And if I have to treat once my honey supers are on, I'm just going to uh, separate the bees and treat the brood. So we'll talk about that later, but that's all. That's all you have to do. The biggest thing right now, water, the nutrition that you provide is not going to compete with what's already available in the environment. Uh, if the weather stays good, this is going to be a really good year. So minimal stuff, just take care of your environment. The next question is James Knoll. If feeding sugar syrup, how many days can it be left on before you need to change it? So my first warning is the only things that you should be putting sugar syrup on this time of year, if you know, you're in our hemisphere, I realize that some people are going into winter in the Southern hemisphere. So for those people, you know, uh, when you put on sugar syrup, and I'm going to talk about these rapid rounds here for a minute. I have several of these and whenever I go out to the bee yard, if I'm going to check on feeders when I'm feeding, and again, we're stopping now, but uh, when I am, I come out with clean ones already, and that's on a five or six day cycle. So even if there's some syrup left in here, I go ahead and pull it and I completely change out the feeder. If you just pour new syrup in the existing feeder over and over, eventually you're going to see a lot of black mold building up and that's not good for the bees. So I swap them out every five to seven days. That's more than enough. If you want to extend the life of your sugar syrup, you can put essential oils in there like Honey Bee Healthy or Pro Health, and that extends the uh, life expectancy of your sugar syrup and defeats the bacteria that causes that black mold. My problem with that is my bees don't really like that uh, essential oil that much, so I'm not using it other than as a replacement for it. Like for example, when I open my beehives this afternoon, I'm not gonna smoke them. We have a super hot day, and uh, they're after water and other resources. So I'm going to be using Honey Bee Healthy, two teaspoons per quart, and I'm gonna put that in a 50-50 sugar syrup sprayer. And that's what I'm gonna spritz the bees with on the landing board and inside as soon as I open the cover. And that's what I'm using instead of smoke to keep my bees calm while I add the honey supers. So, and of course, if it's a really cold day or if it's been rainy and the bees are already challenged by the weather, that's when I'll use smoke instead. But on these hot days, I'm using uh, sugar syrup as a method for calming the bees with essential oils. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is several people have written and they're talking about these rapid round feeders and their, their bees drowning or the bees slipping off of them. Now, so what do we use to clean my feeders. Well, this one's actually clean, but if you notice, there is propolis and burricum around the edges of this thing. So I clean them with hot water. I don't use anything else. And I leave the really sticky residue that they've put on there, the propolis, the burricum, if there's any, that provides your bees with ex excellent traction. And I noticed that they don't even touch the uh, clear dome that goes on here. So when this all goes together, 
the wax that they put on and the propolis that they put on is what gives them the traction to keep them from falling in and drowning. Now here's the other part. Sometimes the bees are getting through the bottom and getting out here and drowning in the liquid. Well, when you look closely at the way this thing is made, there are little shims sticking out here. There's little ears. And I highly recommend that you make sure that the little cover dome that goes in there on these little outermost ears there, make sure that that's going less than nine millimeters. And the reason for that is you want the bees to be unable to get around that base. Some of these apparently are being made differently. None of mine provide enough space for the bees to get out under that and get out into the syrup. So look carefully at that and make sure that it's seeding. I did notice that some of them, when you go to push them down, they might pop up a little bit. Uh, that's a great application for recycling some of your propolis in your hive. If you can get some of that stuff while it's hot and sticky, and put it right on these little tabs here and then use that to hold your little dome down. I think that's a good use for it. And make sure that it seats all the way down. Keep your bees from being drowned. The other thing is keep a half inch of syrup or something in there so that they don't swim out under that. So those are my fixes. I'm not having a problem with the bees uh, drowning in my rapid round feeder, but for those of you who are, those are just some, some things that you might consider. And if that works, Keep us posted and let me know. The other thing is do your best to keep your hives level. Remember that if your hives are tilting side to side at all, uh, you know, the, the syrup will go to one side or the other, of course, and you can have the high side that would open up sooner and then your bees would go out under that and try to get to that syrup. So five to seven days to clean it. And I always change out these uh, rabbit round feeders. So I'm always bringing a fresh one out and I don't clean off the propolis or the wax. Leave that for bee traction. Next, Jason Burton. How do you feel about chloroplast and foam insulation on the outside of hives for the winter? I'm in Virginia and thinking about insulating my boxes for winter. All right, this is, this is an area where a lot of beekeepers don't agree. I have friends that keep uh, bees in Vermont in what's called the Northeast Kingdom where my family originates and that's the Craftsbury area. And uh, there's another beekeeper who does a lot of lecturing and uh, he has his bees right near the border of Canada. And uh, I personally don't insulate my beehives. And, uh, but there are things that you can do. And there's nothing against, you know, if people want to put insulation board, if they want to put that rigid uh, insulated corrugated board around their hives, it, it does benefit the bees because it's going to cut down the wind. So if anything I want to do to help my bees out in the winter in their hive is I want to make sure that wind is not getting through. When we have these extreme weather conditions and the snow is everywhere and the wind is blowing at 40, 50 mile an hour gusts when it's only 12 degrees outside, that is insane. And uh, my bees survived that this year. So I don't, like to put a lot of insulation around it. If you look even, you know, can bees survive that? Yeah, and then of course the argument is, well, you could survive, but wouldn't they do better if they were insulated? Insulation, you have to very carefully manage your humidity inside your beehive if you're insulating a lot. The other thing is I use thermal cameras to look at my hives through winter. And if I have insulation on it, those simply don't work. Uh, the thermal cameras read the surface temperature of a colony and I know what their food levels are. So in the middle of winter, when I bring out my FLIR C2 uh, thermal imaging camera and I look at a hive and I see that it's got three boxes on it or two boxes and the bee cluster is right in the center of that, then I know that there's a lot of food above them and that they're doing just fine. The best insulator for bees is bees. So I think, uh, although you know, you're fine to insulate, if you're asking me what I do, I don't. So I don't add exterior insulation like that. Um, I do have insulation boards on my observation hive, but that's because it has big plexiglass lucite panels. And uh, I want to sandwich that. So I have two and a half inch thick uh, insulation boards that go on either side. And uh, I shut down all their venting except for the outside vent and one inch and a half vent on the inside. 
So they can control it, but they're completely out of the wind. I just do that because it seems right. They have a plexiglass instead of wood. Wood is an insulator. So there is some insulation already coming from the wood. The bees are gonna heat their cluster. They're gonna keep their, their queen alive. And uh, beyond the cluster, the uh, temperature in the colony is going to be about the same as it is on the outside, whether you're insulated or not. So the biggest thing is to reduce moisture on the inside. So have layers of, uh, you know, like you've got your inner cover, you've got your outer cover, you've got uh, air moving through there. You want them to have air movement. You don't want them to have drafting. So I have a whole video on wintering flow hives. If you're interested in that, I'll put the link down um, in the video description so you can see what my guidance is on flow hives wintering and I've been successful at it. This is my 12th year, going to my 13th year of beekeeping, and I've been successful getting my bees through winter without uh, insulation boards wrapped around them. And uh, high numbers, healthy bees, well-fed, plenty of honey, and protection from drafts are the key elements, in my opinion, of getting your bees through winter. The other thing is, I get a lot of snow we have 90 plus inches of snow fall here. So when the snow banks up around my beehives, uh, that's an insulation too. So that's enough for me. Um, there are people that do it. You could probably find lots of videos on using foam board insulation for your beehives. I'm just not one of them that does it. There's another prominent beekeeper who's a commercial beekeeper up in Vermont. I think he wraps them with roof felt so if you haven't looked up roof felt, that's what they put down on your roof sheathing before they start nailing on the shingles. And it looks like black tar paper and it comes in 25 pound felt, 30 pound felt. And uh, they come up with those numbers as the thickness of the felt. And if it were 10 feet by 10 feet, it would weigh 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, whatever. So the higher the number, the thicker the felt. And you could wrap that around your hives and it tears easily. So you could cut out little holes where you're landing board is, and that would of course use the sun's energy to heat things up on the outside because it's black. So I think if I were gonna put something on, I would look at the roof felt over the actual insulation boards because it would kill the drafts and it would provide radiant heat when the sun hits it in winter. So lots of things that can be done there and that's an area where there is no one solid answer, I'm sorry to say. All right, the next one is from Bo Roden. Can you explain bee bread and its purpose? Bee bread, when, uh, first of all, when a queen lays eggs in the cells in the brood frames, she lays an egg and it's an egg that doesn't require any attention at all from the bees other than to keep it warm and keep it from freezing. And three days after it's being laid, if it's a viable egg, it's going to hatch and most of them do. The, the microsecond that that egg hatches, it is now a larva and uh, then the bees will go immediately in and they start feeding that larva royal jelly. Royal jelly is fed to queens, drones, and worker bees. The, the only difference is how much they're gonna feed that to. So when your bees have pollen resources, they have the resources they need to provide the plant protein that those bees need for their incredible development rate. So what they're gonna do, it's called bee bread because uh, it goes through a transformation. This is not just the pollen, the way it comes from the plant on the hind legs of the bee and the bee flies in after foraging and scratches it off and puts it in the cell. They don't just recycle that pollen right out and start feeding it to the larva. What they do is they process that. So the nurse bees are gonna get in there and this is how they make royal jelly. This is how they make the nutrified resource that they're going to give to those developing bees is they mix it with their own enzymes, is they mix it with their own glands that excrete resources that these developing larvae and larvae, more than one larvae, uh, then they will, uh, they will need to consume that. And it's called bee bread because there's even a yeast activity there because we have a sugar and we have a plant protein and we mix those together and it actually off gases, you can smell it. Uh, sometimes I'll go into my bee shed and I can, it just smells different and I know that there's a huge stockpile of pollen in there. I know it's fermenting and it's going through that process. So in that vein, you know, they, they consider that it's bread-like. So because after it's had that 
chemical interaction and then infusion of all those nutrients and its plant protein and it's got uh, nectar and other things mixed in with it and then later is fed to the developing bees then uh, that's bee bread so it's just a term and it's at what stage is it bee bread what's you know um, if we have royal jelly and then later we have bee bread everything's fed royal jelly the question is how much and then is royal jelly fed throughout the development stages of that larva no they back off on royal jelly and then they start feeding more of the straight run bee bread which is again fermented pollen mixed with enzymes that are infused by those nurse bees and then they create a liquid that gets fed and absorbed and they feed that 1700 times a day if it's a queen and if it's a worker well over a thousand times a day who counts that i don't know but they're constantly feeding it and uh, so those little developing larvae are constantly wet they're in a little soup of food and they're constantly churning and if you've watched my recent uh, video of uh, what goes on inside the hive then you've seen it they um they consume that liquid until they become pupae and they're capped off so that's what bee bread is larry collar a lot of bees drowning in the wrapped around feeders okay larry i already answered that so if other people have uh, secrets and remedies for doing that some people were having problems with the uh, carousel feeders these blue feeders like that one back there said that the corners were causing some of the bees to drown that they weren't getting a good footing so i would say the same thing uh, if your bees are putting propolis or wax or anything like that on it and there's nothing stopping you from scraping little bits of propolis and stuff and smearing it on there and creating a nice traction area because we already know that's good for the bees propolis is antibacterial it's good for them and it provides traction so areas where they're slipping stick that on there mark magro bee stings how to tell if you're allergic to bees does venom vary from one to another all right um, if anyone has an allergy to bee stings if it's a serious allergy i you know i should not be giving out any kind of medical advice so i should say on the safe side talk to your general medical practitioner because you can take tests to find out if you have allergies if, if you're going to keep bees go to your regular doctor and say hey i'm about to keep bees am i allergic to bee venom and they can actually do an allergy test on you so that's a good start right there would you be in jeopardy some people have never been stung so it's kind of bad to kind of find out if you're allergic the very first time you get stung by a bee now it can be localized swelling and pain and uh, i just said before in another video when somebody asked what the best treatment is for that we put sting kill on it i should have brought a packet of that we'll do a sting kill down in the uh, video description too so you have a link to that those little capsules will take away the surface pain. They provide some instant uh, numbing of the site so that you don't feel a lot of pain from it, but it can be minor swelling that lasts a couple hours. It can last all week. You can, your hand can feel injured for, you know, you can swell up, your fingers can get fat. Take your rings off right away. In fact, when you're working in a bee yard and your hands are gonna get stung a lot, don't wear rings, don't wear jewelry that can restrict flow if you start swelling. Because if you get stung on the hand, stung on the finger, common places to get stung, that area will swell up and you could end up having a problem with jewelry that you're wearing. So make sure and remove that. So the, the highest risk, of course, is that if you have an increased heart rate, if you have shallow breathing, if you start to suffer respiratory distress, then you would be what uh, an emergency medical technician would call a load and go. So anytime that your vitals are threatened, if you have the inability to breathe or your heart is affected, you need to go to medical right away and you should also have an EpiPen. So you need to find out if those things even apply to you and I would suggest early um, evaluations by your general practitioner to find out what your allergies are. And as far as bees, do so they vary from one to another? The venom is all the same. Even Africanized bees, uh, you know that have there are all the horror stories about them killing animals and everything and, and that's real uh, they're killing with the number of stings it's not that the venom is any more toxic or any more impactful on your health than uh, the regular you know buckfast bees or italians or anything else 
uh, it's the amount of venom that you're going to get. Guess who can deliver the most venom in the rapid sequence? The queen bee. Because a queen may have to hatch out of her cell and fight off several rival queens that are hatching at the same time, and she needs to be able to sting them in rapid succession and doesn't have the time to wait and regenerate venom. So the queen bee, and she doesn't lose her stinger, uh, she can sting several things at once. She's one of the least likely bees to sting a person, but she has the largest venom glands. That's a little point of interest for you today. So that's pretty much it. Um, there are some new things coming out. There are new bee frames coming out. And uh, I've ordered some, and as soon as I get them, we're going to talk about those, and I'm going to be evaluating them and putting them in with some new swarms that I caught. So we're going to find out if that stuff works. That was brought to my attention by Philip Thomas, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and I'll tell you more later. We'll do a video just about those new frames, and it won't be part of the Frequently Asked Questions line. Now let's talk about the giveaway. I was contacted just this morning by uh, the owner of the Blythewood Bee Company, and they're the ones that make the swarm troopers and swarm commander lure pheromones and stuff like that. And they're having a free giveaway, and that's why I left my Oxa Vape Pro Vape 110. These things are expensive, I'm not gonna lie. And the reason that's here is because this company is going to give one away. And all you have to do is go to a YouTube channel that I'm gonna link in the video description and it's a YouTube video. You subscribe to the channel and the instructions, of course, are on the video. And then you can, if you have a Facebook or something like that, you can log in and register for this. It's a $500 value. And it says, uh, giving away a ProVape 110 commercial oxalic acid vaporizer to one lucky winner in the next 30 days. This is a $500 value. Check out the video below, subscribe, and click on the link below to enter the contest. Good luck, everyone. So Blathwood Bee Company, worth uh, subscribing to their channel anyway, if you wanna be up to speed on new products that are coming out and things like that. I buy a lot of stuff from them. They sell the, the feeders that I have. They have, um, they have all kinds of stuff. I don't even, more than I can list right now, but I'll put that link in the video description. You can watch at YouTube and follow the guidelines and get yourself registered to win something free. So again, now if you have questions for next Friday, if you want me to discuss something or look into something, please write your question down in the comment section below this video, and I will be happy to address it if it's something that seems to be of broad interest to many beginning beekeepers. Thank you for watching me today, and I hope you're enjoying a great 4th of July weekend, hopefully not having to work. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.